Those are the things that I'd like you to look at when you see a patient and at least be aware that they exist. So you're not taking a patient that's had a sleep study, says, I don't want CPAP, and just saying, I'll accept that patient. You want to make sure that the physician has evaluated for these things. And if you get a feeling that there's something there that was not evaluated, you want to contact the sleep physician's office or the physician's office and say, I wonder if this is a possibility. I'd like you to reevaluate the patient before they spend their money on a sleep appliance that may not benefit them. Two things we don't know about physicians is physicians are in a money crunch game. They want their patients to be treated without excessive cost. So most physicians are going to appreciate your saying, before this patient spends their money with me, I want to make sure we're doing the right thing. They're also going to appreciate saying, I think you have the expertise to handle an aspect of this problem that I don't. And that's how they make their living. You don't want to go to a physician and say, I'll run the sleep studies. Because the, sleep, the physician's going to say, why would I want you to run the sleep studies? That's how I make my living. So a third thing, a fourth thing about physicians. Physicians work by facts. Don't try to get information or give information by email, written letters. It takes a long time for them. It's hard for them to do. They want to take a fax that you've sent them, check something off, sign it, and have it faxed back to you. So be prepared to use your fax and help their office move communications through. Um, definition of apnea. And in the back of your handout, there will be a list of, uh, right after my presentation, there'll be a list of sleep dental sleep medicine terms. And we'll be going through some of these right here. Apnea. What is an apnea? An apnea is a total cessation of airflow that lasts for 10 seconds or longer. No air moving in and out. It can be obstructive, meaning blockage in the throat. It can be central, meaning no drive to breathe in. And it can be mixed. Very often, you'll treat a patient in which it looks like they have obstructive sleep apnea. You will treat them for the obstructive sleep apnea, and then you're going to uncover the fact that they have central sleep apnea that was being masked by the obstructive. So you need to know that a certain percentage of your patients, you're treating for OSA, you're going to uncover uh, the central component, you're going to feel like a failure, but you need to say, hey, we've handled the obstructive part, now the physician needs to deal with the central. You're going to need to do how to know how to do a follow-up sleep study for this and what to recommend to the physician. Hypopnea, the definition is very variable. Um, it has been that the airflow reduction of 30% lasts for 10 seconds, that's standard, and results in at least 4% oxygen desaturation um, was not adequate. It used to be a 3% oxygen desaturation, but lately the government has been saying, no, you have to have a 4% oxygen desaturation <laughs> because they want it to be harder to grade a hypopnea so not as many appliances are being delivered, not as much CPAP is being delivered. So there are, some of these terms are actually in flux right now. I'm giving you the standard, but this 3%, 4%, you've got to find out what your sleep study is using as the definition. There's something you will begin to hear a lot more of now, a respiratory effort-related arousal called a RERA. It's a subtle fluctuation of respiratory airflow, maybe 1% or 2% de depending on how your sleep center defines it. It involves increased effort to breathe, but it doesn't quite match the um, criteria for an apnea or hypopnea. Apnea and hypopnea and RERAs each involve arousing from sleep to reactivate the muscles of the tongue and the airway to open the airway and allow inspiration. But remember, an apnea, total cessation of breath for a short period, hypopnea, limited um, inspiration for a period, uh, short period of time, and a RERA, much more subtle, 
it's more difficult to breathe in. The person is breathing in, but taking a lot more effort to do so. What you've heard so far in our academies and in what you're reading is the apnea hypopnea index, but RERAs are emerging as a much misunderstood and much missed diagnostic, cri diagnostic criteria for sleep problems. And you need, if you're going to have a, um, a home monitor, you've got to have something that evaluates for these RERAs, the more subtle difficulties in breathing, and you've got to ask your sleep study to, to grade them, including RERAs. The Apnea hypopnea index is an index of how severe your apnea and hypopnea are. The, it's the number of apneas and hypopneas per hour of sleep. So you record how many times the person has had an apnea and hypopnea during their sleep. Maybe it's 70. They slept seven hours. Their AHI is, is 10. It's the bottom line of the polysomnogram of the sleep study. Just to confuse the issue, the respiratory disturbance index is if you add up all the apneas, hypopneas, and raras that they have that sleep period divided by the number of hours of sleep. And so you have a respiratory index that includes AHI um, plus the number of raras. And it's the alternate bottom line of the PSG. When you buy a home study monitor, you've got to know, are they giving you raras or AHI. They're going to call it these days a respiratory index, and you're going, what is it? It's generally going to be your AHI, your apneas and hypopneas, but you want a home study um, or, or an in-office sleep study that will give you the RERAs because that is so critical and is not currently being graded in most sleep studies. The severity of the AHI versus the RDI. Um, again, AHI, apneas and hypopneas per hour, RDI, apneas, hypopneas, and raras per hour. Some sleep physicians and sleep labs measure and treat to AHI. Some, I think the more complete ones, measure and treat to RDI. You've got to know which you're reading, measuring, and working towards. Um, severity. Uh, the, talking mainly about AHI, is that anything below five events per hour, people consider normal. Now, ideal is no events per hour, but anything less than five is normal. Mild AHI is from five to 15 events per hour. Moderate is 15 to 30 events per hour, and severe is anything over 30 per hour. Um, and again, AHI, RDI definition. The severity, the AHI or the RDI, you must use the same measured index, whether it's AHI or RDI, during your original sleep study, during treatment and titration, and at your post study. I've gotten a lot of studies back in which the first study states what the AHI is. A follow-up study says what the RDI is. You can't treat to that. You've got to have AHI, 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 or RDI, RDI, RDI. Hopefully RDI because it gives you a lot more information.